we're going to be looking at this incredible concept of Sabbath and what a wonderful thing it is. But what we're going to do a little bit is unpack what that might mean. It's a word that you're probably quite familiar with, a word that you might have read some books about or you might have heard podcasts or you might have heard people talking about. But we're going to try and get under the hood a little bit as to what is Sabbath actually all about. And so our story, as you might expect, begins at the beginning. So if we go back to Genesis. Now, Genesis is an incredible book. And what people often miss with Genesis is they think it's a history book. But actually, what Genesis is, is a theological history. It's about God primarily. It's about God, what he's like, and how he interacts with people, rather than an exhaustive description of what happened. And Genesis breaks down into different sections. So Genesis 1 to 11 is what we call the prehistory section. So Genesis 1 to 11 deals with everything up until the Tower of Babel. When we go from talking about things on the big scale to the camera zooming in on Abraham and his family. And then Genesis 11 also breaks down into smaller sections. And so the section we're going to look at today is Genesis 1 verse 1 to 2 verse 3, which is the creation account. And we're also going to take a little look at chapter 3 as well. So beginning at the beginning. And I can just recommend if you've never seen the video of someone trying to say in the beginning and stumbling over the word beginning 15 million times, it is very, very funny. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now you may remember if you've been here every week for the last few weeks, a little while back I did a sermon on the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament effectively and we started with this little passage. But the only thing to mention here before we launch into the rest of the description of creation is ultimately this is the story of God creating. That God does this by his own free will. Karl Barth talks about the fact that creation speaks of God's grace. Creation is grace to us. God didn't have to do it. Nobody made him do it. And in contrast to some of the other creation accounts that existed at the time that this was put down into paper, or papyrus, or whatever it is they used back then, this is not an accident. In many other creation accounts, creation happens as a result of the gods battling or warring with one another. And creation is like the side effect of what happens. But this is being very clear. This is intentional. God intended to do this. And we'll see why as we go through. So what follows? We have the first day. We have, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. There was evening and there was morning, the first day. And this is where we start to launch into the pattern of events that follow. Now, one of the things you have to understand about Genesis 1 is it was constructed, okay? It wasn't just a flow of thought. Whoever wrote this went to great pains to build a structure to this entire passage so that he could scream at us some important facts. So what we actually have as we go through is this repetition of these key phrases. Let there be and there was. God saw that and it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the something day. So this is a pattern that's repeated again and again and again, repeated six times. And you'll notice it's in couplets that effectively day one, Light and dark corresponds to sun, moon, and stars. Day two, sea, sky, corresponds to fish, birds. And what we actually have is this idea, as one writer calls it, of forming and filling. So in days one to three, we have the formation. And in days four, five, and six, we have the filling of that formed creation with the things that correspond to it. So as I say, it's perfectly matched. The other thing to say is it's actually what we call a chiastic structure. So the whole thing, when you lay it out in Hebrew, creates this incredible pattern. And that's without mentioning, well, no, I'm going to get ahead of myself. Stop. So we have these rhyme, we have these couplets all the way through. And this pattern of forming and filling. And then when you get to day seven, it changes. And it says, so the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy. 
because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. Notice how many times it says seven. Seventh day. So seven must be important because he mentions it more than once. And so one of the things you have to understand is seven isn't just important there. Seven is absolutely everywhere in this passage. So in Hebrew, the way the verses break down is they're all multiples of seven. So effectively, we have verse one, seven words, verse two, 14 words, which is two times seven. Verse two, verse one to three, which is the matching section. So if it's a chiastic structure, the start and the end mirror each other. So the end is actually 35 words, which is five times seven. We have a number of words that appear in multiples of seven. God appears 35 times, earth 21, heaven 21. And there are phrases that repeat in sevens. And there was seven times, God saw that it was good. Seven times, there are seven paragraphs. I could go on and on and on. You're already bored, I'll stop there. But hopefully you're getting the picture. Seven matters. The whole thing has been constructed to scream at us, day seven matters, okay? There's no magic to the number seven. Seven matters because what happens on day seven matters. Seven has no particular intrinsic magic. This isn't a spell. We're not in Hogwarts. It's a signpost to something that matters. And so if we look at day seven, what we have to recognize is what's missing. Why is day seven different? Day seven is different because it's deliberately left out. There was morning, there was evening, the end of whatever day. So day seven has no end. Day seven deliberately omits the structures of the verses that have gone before in order to scream at you, something is different about day seven. And day seven is eternal rest. Day seven never ends. Day seven was intended to be God's good creation going on into perpetuity. It was not supposed to finish. God made it and it was good. And he made it for us to enjoy that presence with him. So what did day seven look like for Adam and Eve, for the, those inhabitants of that first day seven? Well, if we rattle through, what we'll find is some pictures and some images in chapters one and two to help us understand what life in Eden would have looked like. So the first thing to say is God creates man. And what's the first thing he does is he blesses him. So creation day seven is a place of blessing. It is where God blesses man and woman. It then goes on to say that they will be fruitful, that they have some kind of activity to do in ruling over. So God actually delegates responsibility to man and woman. It says that I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit, they will be yours for food. They don't need to make food. God provides everything they need. So there's a beautiful picture here. Not only is creation grace, day seven is grace. Day seven is God blessing, ensuring the flourishing, ensuring there's food and safety and all these brilliant things for men and women. It also, in verse chapter three, when we look at chapter three, what other images can we get? What other pictures do we get in this story about what life was like on day seven? Well, it talks about the fact the breath of life was in them. Now here, the breath of life isn't just they were alive. The breath of life here is eternal life. It's the breath of God into them, the ruach, the breath of God giving life. And it talks about the idea that there is relationship, that it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him. So in, <clears throat> um, if you're really interested in this stuff, I guarantee that you, you can't do much worse than the Bible Project at the moment. They've got 14 hours of podcast on the word Sabbath. They've got a 50-page free PDF download on the concept of Sabbath. There is so much material on their website. You could spend the next six months, no, the next seven months, studying that to your heart's content. But one of the phrases I really like that Tim Mackey uses about the Sabbath is he calls it as it should be -ness. So when you're thinking about day seven, what is day seven? Day seven is as it should be. 
It's as God created it to be, as God created us to be. And what do we see in that as it should be us? Well, taking all those verses we just rattled through, what we see is a picture of blessing, of life, of abundance, of flourishing, of activity. Peace, relationship, and it's eternal. So if you wanted to summarize it, you could summarize it with the phrase, it's harmony with God, each other, and creation. That was meant to be the eternal as it should be in us. So when we think about day seven or the concept of Sabbath, what the writer is trying to do is scream at you, that is the key. It is God's presence because all those things are made possible by God's presence in the garden. All those things flow from God to us. So the key thing about seven, every time you read seven in the Bible or you hear seven, you need to think God's presence. You need to think God's living in harmony with God, that relationship with God in as it should be us. Because that is what we are longing for. That's what we're dreaming of, and that's our great hope, that one day we will dwell with God in eternal as it should be us. So seven is a whopping great big signpost to that. It's interesting in Revelation as well, at the beginning of Revelation, what do we find? Lots of sevens. Again, the writer of Revelation saying, eternal as it should be in us. But the sad news is, there's a day eight. And that's where we live now. We are living in day eight because what happens? Adam and Eve decide to go their own way. Rather than living in obedience to what God had called them to do, they decide to do their own thing. Now, if you're sitting here today and you're new to church or you're, you're new to faith and you're thinking, come on, Dave, this Adam and Eve thing, this fall thing, surely it, it's, I just can't believe we're all descended from two individuals. Well, let me just ask you this. Just put that to one side for a minute and just think, if it was you in the garden and you had the chance to do the wrong thing, I bet you would, <laughs> because that's what we're like. That's the thing about the story of Adam and Eve, is whether you like the literal approach to that verse or whether you want to take a slightly more pictorial version of it, the truth of it is mankind screwed up. And when you think about what mankind is like, it's not entirely surprising they screwed up. And so what we see is this rebellion where they basically decide they want to be like God. God has said to them, there are some things I know, but I don't think you're ready for it. So there's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as it's called in Genesis, and he says, you can't eat of that tree. There's a line in the sand. You can do anything you like. You can eat from every other tree. You can do anything else you like in the garden. You just can't do that one thing. I don't know if you've seen Guardians of the Galaxy, but there's a bit where Groot has this thing with a big red button on it, and you can watch him literally wrestling with the desire to press the big red button. Do you know what I mean? If we put a big sign up here at the front of church saying, whatever you do, do not touch this button, every child in the building will be drawn to it like bees to honey. They will literally be like, oh, oh it can't be that bad. Now, what we have in the garden is a step further. We have the big red button, but we also have the voice of someone in the ears of Adam and Eve going, ah, it can't be that bad, can it? What will happen? It, ah, he's, he's exaggerating. It can't be that. It could be good. Oh, imagine. What if it pressing it is good? Wouldn't that be fun? Go on, press it. Go on. You know you want to. We are very simple creatures, aren't we? When we're under that kind of pressure, what do we do? We press the button. And so what we have is in Genesis, Adam and Eve press the big red button. They eat of the one tree they're not allowed to eat from. Even though they could eat from every other tree in the entirety of creation, because it's a big red button, they can't help but press it. And so what happens is creation shifts. Creation breaks. And what we see is a change from day seven with all its blessed as it should be us into what we now know as the world around us. 
So the pictures we start to see coming out of Genesis chapter 3 of what is lost. Well, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is this one at the beginning of chapter 3, where it says, God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. You know when God says, I made this and it was good. If you want proof that God thought it was good, it's this verse, because he just loved hanging out in it. He wanted to spend time in this thing that he'd created. He wanted to spend time with Adam and Eve. And this picture of him walking in the garden in the cool of the day is just a beautiful image of God enjoying his creation. And again, once again, as it should be in us. So when they get booted out of the garden for pressing the big red button, the reality is they lose that. They lose that walking with God in the cool of the day. They lose that presence of God with them. But a whole load of other stuff starts to creep in. The first is shame, nakedness. You know, afraid because I was naked, so I hid. They were ashamed of what they looked like. They were ashamed of what they'd done. So they start to hide from God. And then God says to them, because you have betrayed this instruction I gave you, I'm sorry, but this blessing, this as it should be-ness, you've lost it. Ultimately, now, cursed is the ground because of what you've done. And you will have to toil all the days of your life. And so they, instead of this wonderful provision of God, this ease of living, this flourishing, we have a picture of grind, of graft, of, toil, of toil, of turmoil, of difficulty. And so they get banished and they get rejected from the tree of life, which means they lose the ability to live forever. That, that, that death enters the world. And so there's a terrible cost to all of us of that moment. And that cost we are living with now. If you list through those, chap those, those chapters we've looked at, what we start to see is shame, fear, conflict. Adam and Eve fall out over it. Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the serpent. And he didn't have a leg to stand on. No. It's an old gag. I, sorry. I just started saying it and I just thought I had to go with it. Um, there's struggle to grow food and survive. Life becomes really difficult. We have death and they're banished from his presence. So day eight is a picture of disharmony with God, with each other, and with his creation. So what we can see is the great price of what has been lost. And so when we now think about Sabbath, when we look forward, when we think, actually, what is God calling us on to? Well, the good news is because of Jesus, we can enter God's Sabbath rest, as we'll see. And this beautiful picture of Sabbath, as we see in the Bible, unfortunately gets twisted and distorted and just becomes, once again, another thing for us to feel guilty about. But the point I want to make is Sabbath is so much more. And the first thing is Sabbath is so much more than Sunday. Get Sabbath and Sunday out of your heads. It's messing with your thinking about Sabbath. You need to erase the link between Sabbath and Sunday. Because Sabbath is so much more than Sunday. Sabbath is all about eternal rest. Harmony with God, with each other and creation. And if we reduce it to not doing stuff on Sundays, we've totally missed the point. Sabbath is about flourishing and harmony and so many great things. And we want to make it about not doing stuff. I don't know about you. I grew up in Wales in the, in the 70s. Yes, I'm that old. And the reality was, some of you may remember, Sundays with everything shut, with nothing on TV, with parents who just didn't know what to do with you when it was raining. It, it was not a picture of flourishing. It was not a picture of harmony with God and with each other. It was the longest day of the week. It went on forever. I hated Sundays with a passion as a kid because it just felt like life had been sucked out of the community. Life had been sucked out of our family. And it just became about what you weren't allowed to do. Now, I was fortunate. I grew up in a home in some ways that didn't observe Sabbath the way some families did. Poor old Marion, the list of stuff they weren't allowed to do on a Sunday. So the reality is we make it less do you see what I mean? In some ways, we make Sabbath less of a day. We make it less enjoyable, less about flourishing, less about harmony with each other and with God. And that so isn't the picture of Sabbath in Scripture. 
It's meant to be a day of flourishing, harmony with God, with each other, and with creation. The other thing to say is Sabbath is about so much more than stopping. Now, I will admit, one of the translations of Sabbath that's used in Genesis is to cease and desist, to stop. So there's something about stopping, and we're going to explore that over the next few weeks. But the point I want to make today is it's about so much more than stopping. Because the reality is many of us on this hamster wheel that we call life love the idea of Sabbath because we think, I just need to stop. That life is so busy, so hectic, and so we hear this picture of Sabbath. We read books like The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, and we think, oh, wouldn't that be fabulous? What if I could just have a day where I didn't have to do anything? What if you're a single mum? What if you're a subsistence farmer in Africa? Can you stop and do absolutely nothing for an entire day? Is that what God is saying to you? That ultimately you need to feel bad because as a single mum you can't stop. You've got to change nappies. You've got to do all kinds of things that any single mum will tell you is definitely work. You can't stop. So what are you supposed to do? Are you supposed to feel bad because you're not stopping? Is that really what God's saying to us when he talks about Sabbath and stopping? The other thing to say is so many of the websites out there, so many of the podcasts talk about stopping on Sunday in some ways as an apologetic for our capitalist worldview. We work days one to five, days one to six, all the hours under the sun, but we take a day off because God's told us to get a day off because we need that to feel good. Well, maybe working 90-hour weeks is why you're not feeling good. (laughs) I'm not entirely sure. When God talks about Sabbath, he's not creating a fire break in the endless consumption of capitalism. He's not suggesting, actually, we've set the world up under this economic system, and what we'll do is we'll put in these little fire breaks so everyone can get a bit of a breather, then they can go back to making bricks for Pharaoh. That's not what God's talking about. That's not God's plan for us. That's not God's vision for us. And it certainly isn't his vision for Sabbath. And sometimes we think, oh, I just need to stop. If you think it's about stopping, again, I think you've missed the point of Sabbath. St. Augustine. So I'm a little obsessed with um, St. Augustine at the moment. I'm reading a book called On the Road with St. Augustine. Augustine is a guy who lived in AD 354 to 430. So very early on in the church. So just after the church stopped being persecuted, Constantine had made the church the official religion of the Roman Empire, or one of the religions of the Roman Empire. And so Augustine is able to freely preach and write. Now, this is a young guy who is deeply ambitious. So he moves to different major centers where he can pursue his career. And he pursues absolutely everything. Sex, money, power. He goes a bit loopy. He tries everything, does everything, and ends up writing a book called Confessions. And in Confessions, he starts by pointing out that all his activity had come from a heart disorder. And he says, you made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. So rest is found in relationship with God. It's not found in just stopping. It's also not found in a thousand and one other things that we fill our lives with. Rest will not be found by having the perfect house, whether that's by filling it with stuff or Maria condoing the heck out of it so that it's so minimalist. You read stuff like, yeah, well, <laughs> a tidy desk is a sign of a calm and tidy mind. You should see my desk. The reality is, tidy or not tidy, full of stuff or empty, none of that is going to give you rest. Now, this is where we get contentious. Creation is not going to give you rest. Creation feeds the desire for more walks because you get away from it all. It's quiet. It's beautiful. You're surrounded by beautiful surroundings. You've escaped. And the desire for more of that leads to you buying a house somewhere that's very beautiful and trying to get down there every weekend. It just feeds back on itself. You want more, you want more, you want more. Holidays. Who doesn't like a holiday? But the reality of holidays, again, 
As soon as you get back from your holiday, what's the thing you start doing? Planning your next holiday. They did a survey of the top 10 passwords that are in use in the UK at the moment. Number one, I think, is password. Number two is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But I think in the top 10 is the word holiday. Tells you a lot about the psyche of the British people, doesn't it? But again, holidays, that's not going to give you rest. It's nice, but that's not going to give you rest. Any form of escapism. I think ultimately as well, we, in um, Alcoholics Anonymous, they call it pulling a geographic. It's the idea that actually, if I can just move away from here to somewhere else, all my troubles will be left behind. But the sad reality is, unfortunately, you go with you to the new place. <laughs> and lo and behold, you discover a whole load of new troubles. But there's something about this constant desire for more, whether it's more holiday, more weekends, this misunderstanding of actually all I need to do is stop and then I'll feel better. No. Jamie Smith makes this point. He says, the heart's hunger is infinite, which is why it will ultimately be disappointed with anything merely finite. Humans are those strange creatures who can never be fully satisfied by anything created, though that never stops us trying. I think these are incredibly wise words. If you can get into your head one thing out of what I say today, other than me banging on about sevens, is you will never be truly satisfied by anything that is created. Your heart's hunger is infinite because it longs to find rest in God. So all these things, when you're out doing a beautiful walk and you're surrounded by stunning scenery, that isn't rest. That is a big signpost to where you can find rest. It's a signpost to the creator who can give you rest. Sabbath, day seven, is a signpost to the creator who can give you rest. Because Sabbath is what we were made for. We were built, created, made for relationship with God. To know what it is to have rest in him and with him. And if you try and find rest in anything else, you won't find it. But the sad reality, so many of us, rather than embracing God, are hiding from God. I think that picture of Adam and Eve hiding in the garden, I think the children's Bibles make it about the fact that they were naked, but I think that completely misses the point. They had done something they knew they shouldn't, and so they did that all too human thing of running away, of hiding from God. This is Wichich High School. Now, some people complain about the fact that it's called a high school. That's because they don't understand in Welsh. It would be Wichich, well, Prevascol Eglois Newydd, which means Wichich High School or Higher School in Welsh. It's not an Americanism, all right? The reason I'm slightly bitter about this is because it was my school. And so people have a go at me. This is the school that gave the world Sam Warburton, that gave the world Gareth Bale, that gave the world Geraint Thomas, and gave the world Dave Roderick. You're welcome. <laughs> now, if you look at that picture, to the left of the red doors is the old head teacher's study. And he had, outside his door, a system of lights. All right? He had a red light and a green light. And people knew that if the red light was on, someone was in there probably getting their head ripped off. <laughs> the green light meant you could go in. So there were only two types of people who got access to the headmaster's study if you were a student. Either you were very, very good, like me, or you were very, very bad, and you were in a whole world of trouble. So the reality was access to the headmaster was dependent on what you had done. If you'd been good or bad, you could go in. And I think, unfortunately, so many of us, when I talk about God's presence, you think of God like a headmaster. And ultimately, what you're thinking is, I've done stuff wrong, so I need to stay away from him, otherwise I'm in trouble. <laughs> or, I'm being really good, and actually, oh, I just need to do a little bit more. Or, I just need to keep on being good, or actually, I need to do a little bit more again. And, oh, I'm still not sure I've done enough to be able to go into his stuff, so I'll do some more. And we live with this endless cycle of doing in an attempt to win 
the approval of the head teacher. But the Bible is clear that we are so messed up when we think like that. In Hebrews, the writer says, we can with confidence enter the most holy place where God is, God's presence. So I want to say to you today, it's time to stop hiding from God because rest is in his presence alone. So what we need to do is remember that there is a heavenly father who, like the father of the prodigal, is waiting for us to come and be in his presence. The invitation is open. The door is open. There are no lights outside the door determining if you can go in. God has said the door is open. Come on in and experience my rest. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come and find rest. So the writer of Hebrews says, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. If you're here today and you are knackered, if you're beaten down, trod down, fed up, ready to throw in the towel, God's presence is where you will find rest. If you're stressed out, anxious, cross, angry, God's presence is where you will find rest. As we start half term and you're facing a week with the kids, (laughs) I kid you not, God's presence is where you will find rest. Taking them to the beach is not where you're going to find rest. (laughs) God's presence is where you'll find rest. But he says, make every effort. So this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to worship. And we're going to have an opportunity to enter God's rest, to spend time with him, to worship him, to experience his love, his goodness, his kindness, and his grace towards us. Because it's in that that your heart will find rest. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you love us, that creation speaks of your grace and goodness towards us, that you did this, you created this incredible thing for us to encounter you. And that Sabbath is this beautiful picture pointing to you, pointing us to this idea that we need to spend time in your presence, that it's in your presence alone that we find rest. And so, Lord, I pray you, firstly, you would forgive us for all the times that we try and find rest in other things and in other places. Lord, we're turning around and we're coming back to you now to say, Lord, we recognize, like the prodigal, we want to run into your arms and find the rest only you can give. So we say this morning, Lord, we are yours. And we are here for you. Amen.